As our pageant earlier indicated, the story begins familiarly enough. One about challenging times when the Jews were under Roman occupation. Now, not to compare or anything, but I kind of feel like we're living in challenging times these days. Don't you agree? Nobody agrees with me. If so, can I get an amen? amen. Indeed, one can't help but scroll through the news these days and find, oh my gosh, AI, or another fascist leader gets elected, wars, wars, more wars. Oh, and what's this about 77% of, of us have microplastics in our bloodstream? I didn't even know what a microplastic was, let alone the fact that it could potentially destroy our planet and climate change and, oh yeah, the pandemic. Headline after headline, it seems like there's no end to the amount of bad news that we are witnessing. And it's as if it's bad enough for adults, our kids are also experiencing existential threats. I didn't even know that our kids knew what that word meant, right? But existential threats like Ember and Beck's child Asher, for example, who is talking about what would happen if a black hole were to swallow the whole galaxy? What would happen to the rest of us? We'd all be doomed. And indeed, during these challenging times, it's so tempting to reach out and find a Messiah, a Savior to come save us. Cue the theme song from the 1980s. I need a hero, right? Enter from stage right, the sweet baby Jesus. And this story talks about the incarnation. Can you all repeat that after me? Incarnation. All right, one person repeated it after me. Incarnation. It's such a fancy schmancy word that does not mean a type of flower. What it does mean, some of you may have heard of the word carnal, which means flesh. So incarnation means to be in the flesh. Now, I know that some of you might have grown up in religious traditions where this has been interpreted to mean that the sweet baby Jesus was born out of a virgin named Mary. And indeed, that is one way to approach and to interpret this thing called incarnation. But I kind of feel like this whole supernatural, miraculous birth of a savior who was born to save the world is in some ways repressive or exclusive, shall we say. Because if he's the only savior possible, then that means that everybody has to accept the fact that he is a savior and accept him as their personal Lord and savior, and on and on it goes. And not to mention the fact that perhaps this whole idea of being born from a virgin is scientifically inaccurate. Can I get an amen to that? In fact, several of our teachings from, and our, our curriculum, one called Our Whole Lives, which was written by both us and the UCC faith tradition, talks about what it means to look at this from se human sexuality, from an uh, age, appropriately, age appropriate and scientifically based and values based perspective. So I love OWL, I'll promote it everywhere I can because it's one way that we could debunk um, you know, unscientific um, uh, stories out there. So that's one way to look at it. And the, one, the second way to look at incarnation is perhaps to say that, yeah, maybe these historical figures actually existed, and maybe there was a person by the name of Jesus who was born. And in fact, many progressive Christians kind of take this approach that he was fully human, yet existed or exhibited, I should say, special qualities 
that made him human plus, so to speak, right? And later on, there came the gospel according to Monty Python that proposes that maybe there were other special babies born during Jesus' time. Like maybe at the stable and the, the stall next door, there was a baby named Brian Cohen that was born, right? And maybe he too taught a lot of great things to a lot of great people who were listening. And maybe he too was crucified. And at, the, at that crucifixion, maybe there was a choir who suddenly sang, always look on the bright side of life. Maybe that happened. And maybe there was this guy called the historical Jesus that actually walked the earth. Or maybe the third approach is to say that it's all just mythology. It's all a made up story. And yet there are lessons to be learned from this story that the teachings of this guy named Jesus has been helpful throughout millennia. And so what can we glean from it? And what can we learn from his life and his witness? Joseph Campbell, after all, said, all myths are true, and some of them actually took place, right? So if you were to ask me, where do I stand in terms of the three ways of looking at this thing called incarnation? I'm probably a solid 2.5. And that is to say that, yeah, you know, this whole thing about being born of a virgin Jesus actually wasn't the first one. In Greco-Roman mythologies, for example, gods impregnate humans all the time. Ever heard of this guy named Hercules, who was half god and half human, right? And so, and this maybe if these characters did exist in real life and there was historical records of their existences and birth certificates and death certificates and all of that, Maybe the reason why Joseph, during the census, decided to introduce his fiancee, Mary, um, who was pregnant, right? As um, I could just picture Joseph saying, uh, yeah, this is my fiancee, Mary. I know she's pregnant and we're not married yet, but her child is really the son of God. So you better bow down and respect that, right? But you know what? That kind of ruined it for every child that was born out of wedlock because you can never use that excuse ever again, that your child was born because they were impregnated by God. So there is that. Going back to this word incarnation, who cares which approach we take or which, which angle we come at it from? Because again, for me, it goes back to the concept of incarnation. Can you say that word with me again, please? Incarnation. Incarnation also means that uh, the prophet Isaiah talked about it. He says that Emmanuel means God with us. And you'll notice in many shuls that there's a name called Temple Emmanuel which means that this a synagogue, a synagogue is the house of God. And if we were to take this in a broader way, and if we were to say that God is love, then we, can we not say that love is also with us and that within each and every single one of us is an indwelling of love? That not only is love with us, love is with in us. And that means that every single one of us was created in love, and every single one of us has within our core the capability and the ability to have love be born in us. Meaning, by definition, that if we embody love, and if we were to truly incarnate love in every single moment, we would recognize that each body is sacred and whole and holy. Amen? And that includes trans bodies, and that includes women's bodies. Amen? 
And by definition, all us who identify as male embodied individuals have no right to tell women what to do with their bodies. And this is why I am strongly pro-choice, because I believe in the sanctity of women's bodies. And this is why I believe that all trans folks should have the right to health care if they need it. Can I get an amen to that? It is because of the fact that at its core, Unitarian Universalists believe that love is at the center of our values. And indeed, this is what the new Article 2 talks about, which I'm going to have Sheila put up on the screen here, that out of all these values around equity and justice and interdependence and generosity and pluralism, at the core of it, at the end of the day, it is about how we live out and how we incarnate love in our world. And I just want to mention briefly again, I want to go back to this whole concept of incarnation because I bet many of you are wondering, where are you going with this, Jennifer? Um, I already kind of know all of this. And um, so what's the, what's the point? Get to the point here. Well, the point is that we live in a world where we are witnessing the opposite of incarnation meaning that i believe that the reason why we have all these wars and 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 violence and conflict out there is that by being disconnected and being disembodied that we are actually giving in to fear and division and separation from one another so this Christmas, I hope that love makes its way even in the messiest of circumstances. Because notice that this baby Jesus was born in a lowly, stinky manger in Bethlehem. And yet out of that humble beginning, out of that seed of love came a great teacher who taught us that none of this other stuff matters as long as you have love in your heart. So like every great rabbi that's worth their, um, you know, uh, whatever the metaphor is, that's worth anything, that's worth anything about their teachings, like Rabbi Hillel, for example, said that love your neighbor as yourself. That is the whole of the Torah. The rest is just commentary. Or notice when O Holy Night is sung, one of my favorite verses there talks about the gist of who Jesus was. It says, his law is love and his gospel is peace. By the way, if you all need any trivia around that hymn, you'll be happy to know that it was translated into English by a Unitarian minister named John Sullivan Dwight. And the French was originally written by Placide Capot, who was supposedly a socialist. So there's actually some subversive um, messages within that hymn itself. Now, I want to make clear tonight that I believe the incarnation does not begin and end with Jesus. That all of us have the capacity to incarnate love in every minute and every moment of the day. That it takes more than one messianic figure, more than one savior, more than one hero, even if your name is Captain Marvel or any of the Avengers, right? To save our planet. And according to the words of my colleague, the Reverend Julian Soto, all of us needs all of us to make it. Can I get an amen to that? All of us need all of us in order to make it. That when we harness the power of love to once again be, to live into our interdependence, when we harness the power of love to live into pluralism, when we practice generosity and justice and equity, that's when love becomes born in our world. 
Friends, do you believe that love is more powerful than anti-Semitism or Islamophobia? Do you believe that love is stronger than fascism or any strong man out there in the world today? Do you believe that love is more potent than fear and hatred and division that's going on in our world today? If so, then I invite all of us to incarnate love today. May love be born in each and every single one of us today. Amen. Mm -hmm.